A picture of this huge chasm that you couldn't cross over. But across this chasm was a this bridge. And kind of one side of the chasm was quite desolate and barren, and on the other side there just seemed to be life and like a big party going on as a, a city with lights and sound and life. And I just believe God is saying that the cross spanned that chasm for us. That, that chasm that you cannot cross over in your own strength, there's nothing you can do, you can't be good enough, you can't try hard enough, but the cross spanned that chasm for us to step into that life. And yet some of us are still hanging back on the other side. Jesus has paid for it through his body and his blood. He paid for it with his own life upon a cross, cursed for us. And he's saying, my children, cross over. My children, step on over. My children, come into life, come into joy, come into fullness. Just step over. Just make that choice today. You may already say you're a Christian, you may have already given your life to him, but just feeling a bit barren. Make that choice today to step over, say thank you, Jesus. By faith, we step across. Lord Jesus, by faith, we step across your cross. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that as we do, that we will enter in to the place of feasting, to the place of intimacy, the place of fullness, the place of healing, the place of life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Grab your seats. <laughs> I hope you're all well. I'm uh, not going into Philippians again. <laughs> um, it's coming soon, God said. I, I don't know about you, but life is pretty hectic sometimes, isn't it? Uh, it just seems really fast paced. I don't know about you, but just turn me down a little bit, Clive. I'm quite loud. Um, I don't know, just there always seems to be something, doesn't there, on the go. You know, running from one thing to another. If it's not running to get the kids to school, for those of you who've got kids, it's running off to work, it's running off to the shops, it's running around and around and around. And life just can be so hectic. Social life, work life, family life. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it can be so busy that I miss what is going on. I could just miss the beauty of what God has given us through his creation. I could just miss enjoying time with my family. I can just miss enjoying the things that God has given me. And ultimately, I can be so busy that I miss the one. And you might say, well, who's the one? And Jesus would say to you, everyone. Jesus would say to you that he came for the one. He came for everyone. What I mean by that, he came for everyone that you come into contact with, everyone that he has given you to love, to care for, to speak to about him. He's given you the ones that you pass by on the streets that are begging by the shop corner. He's given you the ones that you sit next to in your office day in and day out. He's given you the ones that you hang out with in the dinner room at school. He's given you the ones that you go and play badminton with or play golf with. He's given you the ones that come knocking at your door asking for money and for other things or knocking at your door telling you that they know the way and that their way is not Jesus' way. Every single day, God has given us one person to connect with, to bring his love to, to share his story with. Every day, he's given us one that we can bring an encounter to through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in you, God himself in you. See, Jesus came and gave his very best. He gave his all. He gave his life. He stepped out of the glory of heaven to die the most cruel, oh, cruel death upon a cross. And through his blood, he purchased the one that we are to speak to, to love, to give to. Today, if we may take anything home with us, 
I want us to go out with the intention of who is it today that God has given me. Turn your Bibles to Luke 15. If you have one, please. If not, it may come up on the screen. (laughs) This is probably one of the most familiar of Jesus' stories or parables. And you can probably pick up any kid's Christian book and it'll be in there. Nice fluffy pictures of sheep and stuff like that. This is what Jesus says. Chapter 15, verse 1 of Luke. He says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. I just want you to see where he's at. The tax collectors and the sinners are drawing near to him. I'll just say that one more time. The tax collectors and the sinners are drawing near to him. (laughs) Simon just winked at me. He's a tax collector. (laughs) You're drawing near to Jesus. (laughs) We don't put sinners and tax collectors together, of course, but Jesus did. Um, (laughs) Can you see that? The the most unloved, the most disliked, draw towards Jesus. The people that probably, not the tax collectors so much, but some of the sinners that, 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 that society had given up on, actually are drawn to Jesus. Do you see that? Right at the start here. That they're coming to him. The Pharisees and the scribes start grumbling. The religious people, oh, hi, what's going on here? This man receives sinners and eats with him. Jesus comes for the one, and they draw to him, and the religious scoff at him. You know, I don't care if people say rubbish about us or about me for the name of Jesus. Because he's called us, me and you, to welcome and receive everyone. Oh, he hangs out with so-and-so, or he hangs out with that unsavory lot, or what is he doing going to see them? These are the words I want to hear more of, because Jesus has called us for the one. So he tells them this story, a parable. He says, What a man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. Jesus goes to the ones that nobody goes to. The ones that nobody loves. The ones that people have given up on. And they actually, not only does he go to them, but they come to him. They see something different in him. They are attracted to him in some way. And they are pulled into into something so much deeper than they even realize. Because they are drawn to the love of God. And they are pulled into this place. And Jesus tells this incredible story of a shepherd who has these 100 sheep. And one of them has gone missing. One of them has gone astray. And he leaves the 99 and he goes for this one. And he finds this one. And when he finds this one, he doesn't just say, come on, you know, get your life together. Sort it out. Buck your ideas up. What does he do? He brings them home. (laughs) I love that. He brings them home. This is what we are called to do, church. For those of us that follow Jesus here today, and if you don't know him today, I hope you experience something of his love. Because Jesus calls us to step out of the security sometimes or the the stuff that we know. or he, He asks us to step out of our comfort zone sometimes. To not just go and speak to somebody, not just go and give them good advice, but literally to pick them up and to bring them home. To bring them into the church. And I'm not talking about Sunday here, I'm not talking about a connect group, but I'm talking about a community of people that are so radically loving Jesus that they are overwhelmed when they're brought into that place. That they feel such acceptance, such care, such provision. That there is no judgmentalism, there's no hypocrisy, there is no kind of, you know, tough love, just sort it out. But they are just welcomed and brought in, carried in. 
They can, may not even be able to carry themselves. They may be in such a dark place that the church literally picks them up and brings them into this safe and loving environment. This is what Jesus is calling his church, not just Miles Hill, but his church across this nation to be about. To be about a, a people who are radical lovers, that radically love the king enough to go to the ones that he poured his blood out for and tell them, come home, come home, come home. Who is it that God has put in your mind even now, put in upon your heart even now? Who is it that God is speaking to you about? Who is it? In Ephesians, this is an amazing, amazing passage in Ephesians. If you've got your Bibles, turn over to it. If I can find it. Ephesians 1, verse 15. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which you have been called, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and he has seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, all authority and power and dominion, above everything, Every name that is name. He puts all things under his feet. And what I want to say is that just because Jesus is risen doesn't mean that we cannot go to him. Just because he's risen doesn't mean he's untouchable. Just because he's risen doesn't mean he's just sitting on an ivory throne barking out orders to us. He is risen so that we can be raised with him. He's risen because he draws us up into him. He's risen so we go out and tell others and bring them up into this place with him where they can experience his love, where they can experience his care, where they can experience his grace upon them their life. I've been meditating on these words from the Bible this week, and it's from the fullness, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. From his It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. It is only possible because of who he is and what he has done. Because of his fullness, we all have received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And that's not just for us in here, but that is for this world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. He did not come into this world to condemn the world, but he came in this world to save it. I love it when Jesus says, I didn't come for those who are well. I didn't come for those that have got it fixed and sorted. I didn't just come for those who think they've got righteous living. I came for the sick. Jesus says he comes for the one. Because he loves his people. He loves the church he loves passionately he loves he loves what it says towards the back end of Ephesians Ephesians 5 25 it talks about husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he may sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that they might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that might be holy and without blame, blemish. They obviously wanted to hear about the one. <laughs> he loves the church. You know, sometimes the reason why we don't bring people back to the house, to the church, is because we don't love it the way Jesus does. So easily we've got caught up in this concept of what the church is about and that we've got caught up into just little bits of niggles and struggles and we think, oh, it's just a hard place to be and I'm not sure about this, I'm not sure about that. 
But that passage tells us that Jesus loves his church and gave his life up for her, for you and for me. That he loves this church so much that he went to the cross for us. And in the same way, if we begin to love each other and we love being together in community, more likely will we bring people into it. You see, we can easily sometimes go and love the one, but we just leave them where they are. I hear lots of stories of people saying, oh, I spoke to this person and they made a commitment to follow Jesus. And I said, where are they? Oh, um, I don't know. So, uh, I spoke to this person and they accepted Jesus into life. Brilliant, where are they? They come, to, they come in to, to be, be with the community of God's people? Um, uh, no, I don't think so. See, we're not just going to call, call just to speak with people and leave them where we are. We're to bring them right into this place. Because Jesus loves us being in community together. One of the things I prayed earlier was that he inhabits the praises of his people. That God is looking for communities, whole groups of individuals that together bring his presence and his glory in a way that no individual can. That corporately we gather under the anointing of the presence of God, the God who lives in us and yet still gathers his community in his presence, that we encourage others to come into that place. Because there is a greater anointing, and I want you to know this, there is a greater move of God's Holy Spirit, and there will be greater moves of God's Holy Spirit upon groups of people who gather for the purpose of presence of encountering Jesus. Uh, what, but I encounter Jesus every day. He lives in me. Yes, he does. But the problem is, is if all we make it is this active force that I go out with the authority of Jesus, I cast out the sick, I raise the dead, I cleanse lepers, it becomes no relationship. It just becomes works driven by an active force. No, the Holy Spirit is a person that lives inside us and he loves to relate to us together. And he comes and he inhabits in glory together in a way that he doesn't on individuals. We haven't experienced it yet. You know, from time to time, we glimpse at it. From time to time, together, we, we experience something. We gather something. And, and I believe the momentum's gathering. I believe the momentum's increasing. I believe that, that God is saying this new wave, this new, this new area that we're stepping into is about this radical love that together in community, we work out how we host the presence of God together. How we communicate, how we connect with God together. So that when people walk into this place, they encounter something that nothing in the world could ever give. They encounter something that nothing in this world could ever give. That's what God is calling us to be about. If you flip over to Matthew 10, this place of of gathering, this place of scattering is what we are about as God's people. Back end of Matthew, Jesus said, he called his people and he said, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what he was saying is, is so as we go out for the one, we bring them back in, and we, we bring them into this community through baptism. We bring this community through communion, which we do in our small groups, and occasionally on Sunday. We do this together as we worship. We do this as we share God's word. We do this as we, as we bring songs to one another, as we bring words and pictures to one another, that we begin to start to experience something of God's fullness. You see, I relate to God in one way. I connect with him in one way, you connect with him in another way, you connect with him in another way, and you with another way. And so that when we come together, we begin to express something of God's multifaceted, multidimensional nature. That together in the way that we connect, in the way that we relate, in the way that we communicate, that when we come together, we bring all these bits together and we begin to see the, the depth of who God is, the variety that he brings, the splendor of who he is. And I I love that, the way that we can all meet with God differently, the way that we can all bring something. (laughs) Paul says to the the Galatians, he says to them, when you come, some of you bring a psalm, some of you bring a hymn, some of you bring a spiritual song. He was saying, come together in community and bring what God has given you upon your heart, because together we begin to reflect something of God's greatness. So as we go out to the one, we bring them back into this community in which we love because Jesus loves. So we go out with this power and with this anointing. And I want to read, I've read this so many times, but I just want to highlight it again. When we, when we stop for the one, when we're inconvenienced by the one, 
we sometimes might need to bring them a cup of tea. Sometimes we might need to bring something to eat. Mate. Sometimes we might just need to listen to them. Sometimes we might just need to, I don't know, bring them something, bring something to keep them warm. It, it could be anything. But what they ultimately need is an encounter. And this is why Jesus says this in Matthew 10, verse 5. He says, These twelve Jesus sent out instructed them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're to be a kingdom people. And this is the marks of the kingdom. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. You receive without pain, give without pay. And he talks about going and leaving peace in situations. He goes about leaving the shalom, the wholeness of God, into every situation. And so what he's saying to us is that we go and we meet practical needs, that we are to love as he loves, but in so doing we should demonstrate something of the kingdom. If I see a sick person, who say, say someone's begging on the streets, and they're crippled, they've got a walking stick, they can't walk, they haven't eaten or drunk for a while, so I go, I get them something to eat, I get them something to drink. I satisfy their natural, their natural needs. But they're still crippled, they're still stuck there. They've experienced something of God's love because it has to be an outflow of God's love. It can't just be, as I said, just this dynamic power. It has to be something of an outflow of God's love. But say then I say to them, in Jesus' name, stand up and walk and leave your stick behind and they get up and they walk away. Suddenly the kingdom has broken in in a way that they cannot deny. Suddenly the kingdom has broken in in a way they cannot deny. Some of the problems that I often get when I speak to people that don't believe in God or, or are not interested in the community of church is that there's so many great people out there. Even Christians can say this. There's so many great people out there that do so many great works and they don't believe in Jesus. Now partly that is because they're made in his image and they reflect something of him to this world. And we love and we reflect but if that's all it is, if we are just mimicking the world in provision naturally, then, we are, then the world is missing out on an encounter with God. The world is missing out on an encounter with the living God. So if we come in demonstrating of the, the power and the spirit, if we take the risk in saying, stand up and walk, and we see a miracle break in, then you cannot deny that the kingdom has come. I, I heard recently of somebody with a, with a, with a tumor who uh, have been prayed for, and it's completely disappeared. It's completely disappeared. You cannot deny, even the doctors would say, how on earth? You cannot deny that the kingdom comes when those things happen. And we are to be a people that walk in the supernatural. So when we go and we stop for the one, that we need to be inconvenienced, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us in the way that he does, in the way that we connect, so that we stop for those ones. And the importance is, yes, we can meet practical needs, but we want them to meet and encounter a supernatural living God. And if we are listening to the Holy Spirit, we can ask him, how on earth, God, do you want us to act? How do you want us to walk? And the reality is that God doesn't like sickness. He doesn't like pain. He doesn't like sin, and he's wiped them all out through the cross. And we can stand in that. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Sometimes we pray and nothing happens. You might say, sometimes? <laughs> I always pray and nothing happens. <laughs> I've prayed five times, ten times, and I gave up. I've prayed a thousand times. And my answer to you is, don't stop. Don't stop. People, you guys may have heard of, uh, of a couple called Roland and Heidi Baker who've got a ministry called Iris Ministries out in, in, uh, in Mozambique. And they actually have got this movement called Stopping for the One. If you ever get to read it, uh, it's a charity that they run uh, linked to Iris Ministries. But they pray for the sick continuously. They pray for the blind for their eyes to be open. They pray for the deaf for their ears to be open. And when they first moved over there, when they first moved over there, they started doing all these drama skits. They tried to do kind of music, and they tried to attract in these different people through entertainment. And they suddenly realized it didn't work. Because you can't entertain somebody into the kingdom. You see, whatever we do here to, on a Sunday, and we've got the borders coming next week, and we're going to do things to, for them to connect, but we cannot entertain them into the kingdom. I could, we could do some myriad of one fun things, but we cannot entertain them into the kingdom. So they stopped, and they began to pray. They began to pray that God's presence would come in. They began to start praying for the sick. And I believe they started praying for deaf ears to start with. They prayed for 200 deaf ears before the first one opened. 200 deaf ears before the first one opened. 
What I want to encourage us today is what people don't need is an entertainment, but they need an encounter. And they need to encounter the living God. And if you've prayed, and you've prayed, and you've prayed, keep praying. 200 deaf ears before the first one opened. Another 200 before the next one opened, probably. But now they are seeing more deaf ears healed than not healed. Why? Why does it work that way? Are we bullying God into it? No, God works all the time. We're just learning how to work with him. We're learning how to persevere with him. We're learning to be co-laborers with him. We're learning to say we won't give up at the first battle. We won't give up at the first hurdle, but we will continue and we will persevere because we believe that God has called us for the one and to bring them an encounter with a loving God who is good. I want to encourage us today. Look at Jesus' life. Let's just take a few examples of how Jesus worked. Matthew 8, if you've got your Bibles. Jesus cleanses a leper. It says, When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you, if you will, can you can make us clean. And Jesus stretches out his hand and touches him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priests and offer the gifts that Moses commanded for a proof to them. So Jesus is going about his business. Somebody with leprosy, an outcast of society, somebody that the world has shunned comes along and Jesus stops. Now he doesn't just say to him, here's some food, here's some drink. Jesus loves you. <laughs> he says in Jesus' name, be healed. He cleanses them of their sin. The kingdom comes and breaks in to his life. Mark 5 just going to whiz through some of these. I just want to give you a flavor of how Jesus worked and how he caused us to work. Mark 5, 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, seeing him fell at his feet and said, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be weighed well and live. And he went with him. And a great cloud followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who was, had a discharge of blood for 12 years, who had suffered much under many physicians and spent all she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. Some of you might be able to identify with this. You've given, you've prayed, it gets worse. It just gets worse. See, Jesus is going to raise a dead girl and he gets, meets this woman that's been bleeding for years. She heard the reports about Jesus. She began to believe. Her faith began to, began to rise that something could happen, that this Jesus could make a difference, that everyone else didn't, but maybe just this one time. So she comes up behind him in the crowd and touches his garment, for she said, if I even touch his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her diseases. And Jesus, perceiving his, himself that the power had gone out of him, immediately turned and said, Who has touched me? And the disciples said, Do you see the crowds pressing around you? Yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see. But the woman, knowing what had happened, came to him in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in shalom, in wholeness, and be healed of your diseases. Jesus going off to raise a dead girl, which he does. Meets a woman with a bleed. She actually takes a deposit of his spirit for her healing. And not, he doesn't just carry on and walk in on. He stops and he gives her time. And he tells her that she is whole and she is healed. Jesus always is sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit. You say, but Jesus is God. Yes, he is God. But he worked through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he shows us that we too can be that sensitive so that if somebody needs a down payment of God's presence in their life, we can even experience that power being taken from us for their healing. That we can be that sensitive to what God is doing. John 4. Verse 7 says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from a woman of Samaria? 
Jesus answers, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw. And Jesus says, go, call your husband. She says, I have no husband. He says, yes, that's right. And he speaks directly into her life. And he allows of her, this woman, caught in adultery. Caught in adultery. He loves her in such a way that he still allows her to drink from the water of life. You see, sometimes when we meet the one, and Jesus' example is that we don't come with any preconceived ideas. We don't think, you've got to buck your ideas up first. You've got to change first. Sometimes we just need to bring them an encounter. Sometimes we just need to bring people God's love. Sometimes we just need to allow people to drink deep from him. You see, don't go into the world thinking you've got the ideas or you know how to sort this one out. Go completely dependent upon the presence of God in your life. Desiring him to turn up in every encounter. For him to turn up in every situation. You might be very skilled at the work that you do. I know a lot of you work in social systems. You might be incredibly skilled in what you do. But don't rely upon that. Depend wholly on the living water. So that people can not just drink of you, but they can drink of him, Jesus Christ himself. And you might be here today and you might be feel that you're caught up in sin and difficulties and troubles. You might feel that, that uh, you can never come to Jesus. Jesus says, come, come to me and drink. Come and receive his fullness. Come and receive his life. Jumping over to John 5, it says in verse 1, after this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate of Paul in Aramaic called the Bethesda, which is five roofed columnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed, one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. 38 years he was unable to move and to, to live a normal life. For 38 years he was stuck. When Jesus saw him, he knew that he'd already been there a long time. He said to him, do you want to be healed? That's a crazy question, isn't it? Sometimes we can be so stuck in our sickness that we actually find comfort in it. Do you want to be healed? The sick man answers, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus says to him, Get up, take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Jesus is inconvenienced. This man, no one to help him, he stops. And he allows him to encounter his love in the kingdom. I hope you're getting a picture of what God is doing, a picture of who Jesus is, a picture of how he loves. And finally, Luke 23. Luke 23, right at the back end of Luke. Verse 32, it says, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. This is Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, where they crucified him and the criminals, one was on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching but the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, he's chosen one. The soldiers mocked him, offering sour wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? 
and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You know what struck me so much about that? Is that Jesus is hanging upon a cross. He's going through the most agonizing, cruel death you could ever imagine. His whole body is wrought with pain. He's suffocating in his own blood. And he still stops for the one. He stops for the guy who's going to be hanged next to him with no hope, with no God, with no life. And he stops. And that man encounters him, encounters God's love and forgiveness. Right there on the cross where Jesus is about to pay for it all, this man encounters God's love so that he wouldn't end up in hell, but they could have eternal life. The Bible tells us that no greater love is this than to lay down your life for somebody. And Jesus' whole lifestyle is one laid down for the needs of the one. Jesus spoke to crowds. He, spoke, he, he gathered large groups of people, but he always, always, always stopped for the one. He told that story. What if a shepherd has a hundred sheep and loses one of them? Doesn't he leave the 99 to go and rescue the one? There is a party in heaven for everybody. For everybody who's drawn back into the house of God. For everybody who's drawn back into the presence of God. For everybody that we go and bring God's love and an encounter with his presence to and bring them back into this community we call church. There is a party that goes on in heaven just when we stop for the one. And you know, I hear story after story of people in this church doing that very thing. I hear story after story of people stopping and loving and giving and praying and serving. I hear story of people being inconvenienced for the one. And I want to encourage you today. Don't stop. Don't give up. Even when it is so tough. Even when you've prayed 200 or even a thousand times. Even when you've chickened out and you knew you were supposed to. And you just got a little bit anxious, a little bit nervous, thought, what are they going to think of me? Don't give up. Don't ever stop. We need to be a people that gathers under the presence experiences something of God's love and anointing upon our life and then take that wherever we go so they may encounter him. In Romans 5, it tells us that Jesus has poured out his love into our hearts and it is only possible for us to live this way because he has done that to us and for us. Let me finish with just a couple of things. 30 says this, verse 17, I will restore health to you and your wounds I will heal, declares the Lord. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, all your sins. Whoever you are today, through the blood of Christ, they are forgiven and wiped clean. And he heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. He satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Keep praying 
even when you see no results. Because through Jesus, he has purchased everyone's life, everyone's diseases, everyone's sicknesses. He says he heals all of your sicknesses, all of your sins, all of your problems, all of the things that you just struggle with. And he says he will renew your strength. Do you know, these bodies of ours, they get old, sometimes get sick and decay. It's not meant to be that way, you know that. It's never meant to be that way. Do you know we can live in the fullness of God so that we don't get sick and we don't even die because his life is in us and we can go just to be with him when he calls us home. That we can live in such a radical anointing of his presence where we live in full health and healing where even our Strength is renewed. Isn't that incredible? And we're not to keep it to ourselves, but we are to share it with the world. So please, go and stop for the one. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for who you are. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these truths. Lord Jesus, we just thank you that you are a God that loves. Lord, that you're a God that gives. That you're a God that saves. You're a God that heals. Lord Jesus, I just thank you, Lord, that your example to us is of one that is always inconvenienced. You're one that demonstrates kingdom power through the supernatural. You're one that drew, drew people home. And Lord God, I pray as a church, Lord, this has been the message of our house for this last year. This has been our message for this last year, that we may step into this fullness. Lord God, that we may be carriers of your presence. Lord God, that the supernatural will be the normal part of our everyday life, Lord God. And Lord God, Lord Jesus, we know that that is birthed from that place of love that you've poured into our hearts. And so, Lord God, Lord, just Holy Spirit, we just ask you to keep pouring out your love into our hearts. Keep pouring out your spirit into our hearts. Keep pouring out your life into our hearts, Lord God. Lord, we just ask you that you would just keep molding us and shaping us. Lord God, we are desperate for you. We need you, Lord God. We need you, Lord Jesus, every day. We need you to breathe. We need you to, to wake up. We need you to speak to people. We need you to do our jobs. We need you to love our families. We need you to, to be about our school friends. Lord God, we need you every single day. And Lord God, we just ask that each day that we will take time to be filled by your love and by your presence. Lord God, so that when we stop for the one, they don't see us, but they encounter you. They don't see us, but they encounter you. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.